people of color that they they get these extra requirements, right? Yeah. And, and you know everybody is no, it's absolutely true. That's true. You know, and and they're trying to and they can try to justify it all the way they want, but like if you have population counties with a, a higher unemployment rate, um, then you are exempt. Coincidentally, all of those are white, or they have a large population of seasonal workers. And if you had a lower county population rate, uh, like many of our larger urban counties do, um, that they, they were included uh, at the, the, the work requirements. But when you break down that data and you actually start saying, right, but what if we looked at city data or zip code data, right? So, because just because my county has a job doesn't mean that I'm living in one city. I can drive 25 miles uh, without any buses to get to work every day to get that job that's barely paying <coughs> minimum wage, right? So, uh, so folks are starting to back off from it, that part of it a little bit because people called them for what it was. It was racist. But it's also just dumb because here's the problem with the, the current plan as proposed that essentially creates this needle you're supposed to, this needle you're supposed to thread where um, you have to work just enough hours uh, so, you didn't, so your employer didn't have to offer you full-time health insurance uh, under the Affordable Care Act but too many hours that you'd end up, then you'd end up actually staying on the program in the future. Because if you worked at minimum wage at the hours that they required, it'd actually kick you above the amount that would then make you eligible for the insurance in the first place. People called him out on this. Then, when you start looking at all the exemptions that they wrote into it, people start actually saying, well, first, if you've got more exceptions to the rule than the rule itself, maybe it's a bad rule to begin with. <laughs> and when you start looking at the specific exemptions, they still weren't even well thought out. Right, so okay, if you have a kid at home, if you're uh, if you have a child at home under the age of six, you can you can uh, uh, you can be exempt from the requirements, right? But in Michigan, you can't leave your children unattended uh, until they're 12. So if you've got a seven, eight, nine-year-old, right, and maybe you've got a seven, an eight, and a nine-year-old, right, it made more economic sense for you to stay home uh, and, and and watch those kids than it did to put all three of them in a daycare program. But right, you had to you had to go to work. Uh, which actually then cost you more money to keep the insurance that you might need to make to keep yourself well. And by the way, this was going to cost the state millions of more to do. It was going to require that uh, it, you know it was going to require that all the scheduled hours that you had that you could work were actually going to be offered to you. Anyone know someone that's shown up to a shift that then got sent home early, right? They got cut because it was it was just we're not busy today, right? So what about them? What are they supposed to do? So if you're saying that I, that I have to work to get insurance, you're gonna guarantee me those hours? Well, we don't wanna do that, right? Every part of this plan is designed to create more hoops, to punish folks who are just doing their best to try to keep themselves and their family <laughs> healthy. And talk about a stark contrast between Republicans and Democrats. Thanks. Sorry, I'm off my soapbox. We're done. <laughs> I knew he had a lot to say. That's why I wanted to go first. So. <laughs> All right. The next question that we have, representatives, is what are you doing to get the House majority? <coughs> well, I, I guess I'll start again. Um, well, fortunately for me now, on a personal note, I don't have a primary, so that, that makes things a whole lot easier for me, and our general looks like it's going to be, you know, okay. Um, we still have to pay attention to it, but at the same time, it really frees me up to get across the state and try to hit some of these um, areas that our caucus is identifying as key seats. And I know that you know more about the, where those key seats are at than I do, probably. But um, you know, but we have we have one right down there by you, Battle Creek, and of course the 91st right next door here. Uh, but it really gives me the time to get out and uh, and try to campaign, knock on doors. Um, just help help those people out so that we can get those back those nine seats. That's what we got to get is nine seats, and it's going to definitely if we can get those nine seats back, it changes <coughs> everything. Uh, it's going to really cut down on a lot of these crazy discussions that we have to have and um, about some of the stuff that's going on in Lansing. Um, so that and then actually what I'm doing too is you know we're doing a uh, an event. Can I talk about that event here? We're doing an <coughs> event. Um, uh, the day after the primary. I know a lot of you don't know about it because we're in the very initial stages <laughs> of putting it together. Very initial Breaking stages. news. <laughs> Breaking news. You're the first ones to hear about it. But uh, we're going to have an event here in Muskegon um, on the Port City Princess. And um, uh, the owners of the Port City Princess have been very gracious in allowing us to use it for a fundraiser so that we can try to raise money for the House Dem Caucus. So you're, you're not necessarily raising money for me. 
We're raising money for the House Dems so that we can take that money and instead of putting it into the 92nd district, my district, or John's district, we can take that money, we can spread, let the caucus figure out where that money is gonna go to across the state in some of those key races so that we can win back those seats. So that's what, that's what I'm doing personally. Uh, what I'm doing personally is I'm the finance co-chair for the House Democratic Fund. So part of my job is raising money to make sure that our great candidates have everything that they're gonna need to actually win. And by the way, as part of that job as the finance co-chair, uh, I've been helping with the team reshape where we're spending our money and how we're spending it. So, you know, I know a lot of folks always get upset. We wait till the very end and spend a lot of money on TV. Yeah, I, we, we got the message, right? So we're investing more in people early and organizers. We're out talking to, to people at their doors. <coughs> um, we're investing in campaigns earlier uh, so that they can get their message out and actually start communicating with people to get them engaged. And that's a huge difference. Um, one of our big races, it's no surprise, is gonna be that 91st seat, right? So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sharing any uh, top secret information here. So one thing that I'm gonna be doing is making sure that we raise money to support the winner of that great primary. One thing I want you all to be doing is uh, helping pick someone in the primary, have run a really clean, positive campaign where you're talking about why your person is great. And then we're getting, and we're talking to Democrats about why 2018 matters, right? There's a blue wave coming, but we all gotta get a bucket and help bring the water here, right? And so, you know, for all of us, I think it's about uh, what are we doing to make sure that we're actually keeping folks engaged? The other thing I'm doing is uh, making a plug that says you should make sure you still give uh, my very good friend Terry Sabo a couple of bucks here so he can pay his caucus dues. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, if I could, thank you very much. I, I just want to, uh, if I could, I want to go a little bit deeper. I know we, but we have both candidates for the 91st here, and I think it's only right since we're talking about it. Yeah. Do some. Tandy Kabala, could you uh, just kind of wave and let make sure everybody knows who you are? Sure. And then Andy O'Reilly here in the front. Um, so those are our two candidates for the 91st district. Um, and this we have is Chris Banks, who is candidate for the state house in the 90th. In the 90th district. 90th district. Okay. okay. Welcome. Great. Yes. yes. All right. Welcome. Um, yeah. So I mean, these are these are the people that we need, and I, I sh want to make sure that I note that. We have a candidate in every one of the 110 House seats. So that's um, incredible. I think it's really good because there's obviously there's some seats that are they're going to be really hard to win for us. And you know what? That's okay because we have some that are that are like that as well. But the key thing is you're, we're going to be able to keep some people at home. And I, it's one of the things that I saw when I was on the county commission here is that we for years we had a couple of commissioners that didn't never had an opponent. So. Um, come, come the uh, general election in November. So they didn't have anything to do. So what were they doing? They were out campaigning for everybody else. Um, so now it's really important, or I'm really thankful that not only at the county commission level here in Muskegon County, but um, for all 110 of those seats, we got candidates in all those seats. And I'm gonna tell you what, as John mentioned, we got some really, really good candidates. I've had the opportunity to meet quite a few from across the state, from the UP all the way down to the, to the southern state line. and. We've got some very good candidates, and they are excited. They are energetic and raring to go, as, as with the ones that we have right here in Muskegon and in Ottawa County. So um, that's, that's a good thing. Great. Absolutely. The next question is, this individual says, I don't see anything about poverty or race, people of color, or LGBTQ rights or women's rights. What are the Democrats doing to prevent discrimination? Fantastic question. So that's like my platform. So thank you. Um, so a couple of things, right? When we talk about our opportunity for all agenda, um, we actually have, we've built this out and we're talking, uh, one thing we're doing really specifically is noting, uh, we really do believe that we want to build an opportunity where folks have, an, have the ability to thrive, right? And that we need to remove those barriers that uh, are preventing people from having their shot at opportunity. And that's, that's the big difference between, I think, of Republicans and Democrats. So that's where we're approaching all of our policy from. Now, when we actually start breaking all this stuff down, if you wanna read the full Opportunity for All agenda, it's really clear. We, have a, we specifically are talking about making sure that we are protecting uh, women's <coughs> access to full healthcare coverage. We're talking about LGBT people, LGBTQ folks, uh, keeping them free from discrimination. That is the bill as one of three openly gay members that I've been carrying now for the last four years Please give me some more Democrats so I can actually get it passed in the House. Um, you know, when it comes to low income, we are talking, I mean, 
the first, the whole entire Medicaid expansion and work and the, the Medicaid uh, debate is is about poverty and uh, folks who are working and in poverty. Because right, those are the are typically the folks that are on Medicaid. They've got a job. It's just their employers aren't paying them enough. And when we're talking about the rest of this stuff here, we're doing it from a lens, an intersectional lens. <clears throat> so we don't talk about schools if we're also not talking about the impact of poverty on education, on the fact that we need to make sure that, we're, that we are investing more in areas where there are more free and reduced lunch concerns because we know that the impacts of poverty compounded in an area actually decrease educational attainment. It's why when we talk about funding for, for K-12 schools, and by the way, even the latest report shows we're still not funding our schools by about 2,000 bucks per kid per year. You know, the difference is if you're in poverty, you've got nothing to make that up. If you are rich, mom and dad can take care of that with summer camps and other educational opportunities. We are talking about those things. You know, in the end of the day, uh, when we're talking about roads, we get it. When, you know, basically half of folks can't deal with a $500 repair bill to their car, right? You know, we get who we're talking about here. Most of us can't afford the $700 pothole tax that we're paying every year. We're just blessed that it doesn't all come at one time, right? And that is the difference. So, you know, absolutely. If you want to talk about more about the, the each specific policy, we've got those, and they are we're, they, we are on our agenda. Uh, we're also keeping it broad issue to show that you know it's about these things that impact all of us. They just impact us all in slightly different ways based on who we are and where we're at in life. I don't even know where I, we have to have. John, correct me if I'm wrong. Fifty to se, at least fifty to seventy-five bills that have been introduced by the Democrats to address those issues that you that you brought up on the card there. John. Would you say that's a fair number? Oh, at, at, least, at least right. Like we have our teacher package, our teacher prep package had twenty-three bills that were specifically about ways that we improve and invest in quality teachers. Yep. Our better classroom was another like eight, right? And so I can, I can off the top of my head think of like 30 or 40 bills yep. that we said, here's ways to improve achievement in our classrooms. But, but they go nowhere. Right, and that's, exactly. And then, you know, and this is on every issue. The Progressive Women's Caucus has been doing an amazing mm -hmm. job advocating for women, but for all of us, because women's issues impact all of us. And I will say, um, in, in a nod to bipartisanship, when it came to uh, dealing with the terrible Larry Nassar situation at Michigan State University. It was amazing to watch the Progressive Women's Caucus say, we've been talking about issues related to college sexual assault and sexual assault in general for years now. Would you like to work together on these bills? And